what, what the mate is talking about. Even, even in the Ebony magazine, so there was like a six, in 1962, I think, Ebony magazine did a six-page article on my mom. And it actually leads with that hundred slave story that we talk about in The Uncomfortable Truth. Um, me and my mom has said in the past that, you know, when she would go down to Georgia, you know, you, you were raised on this story, but you would go there and go, so where did all the money go, right? What happened? Um, and yet she won the war. Sherman marched. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah. Sherman marched and burned everything down. But uh, it was my aunt who went into the family history records and just started really kind of piecing things together years ago, and and discovered that yeah that those numbers don't add up uh, remotely. Um, and we did enslave six people. That's our immediate family. But as you branch out to you know. You know, beyond the, the straight line, there was plenty of other people that, in our family that were enslaving other people. Your family go your your your, your family roots into slavery go all the way back to Jamestown. That's the beginning. Sixteen ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we arrived. Okay. But he came as an indentured Just servant. This kid who had been hijacked off the streets of London as a ten-year-old and sold into indenturement. And Jamestown. And then he eventually owned slaves. It was like, well, you know, like. Uh, yeah, they owned two plantations. On two plant, yeah. yeah. How do you reconcile that though? Like, you know, to, to know that, you know, like right now, the climate that we're in right now, the racist climate that we're in, yeah. at this very moment, you know, your family had a had a lot to do with that, you know, yep. at the beginning. You know, how do you, how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile that? Well, I just figure every family, if you dig enough, has awful things to be told. We just don't usually dig. So that's the way we were. And now my job is to Try to make things like they should be, rather than like they are. How do you get more white people to get that same? Uh, you, know, you know, a lot of people say the past is the past, but the, diff the difference is is that the, the remnants of the past still affects us to this day. And right. so, how do you get enough? How do you get other white people more involved and white people to see that to say, okay, maybe you didn't own any slaves, but you benefit from slavery to this day. You benefit from the remnants of slavery. You know, your your many white families today uh, are eating real good mm -hmm. uh, off of slavery. Many of our major institutions, like banking institutions, Chase Bank, Wells Fargo Bank, Bank of America, uh, you know, Columbia University, uh, all of these, uh, Princeton, all of these uh, Ivy League institutions. Uh, at one point, they actually owned slaves. Well, you know, the house was built by slave labor. Exactly. You know, the White House was built by slave labor. Exactly. So, 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 but so how do you get white people to understand that, more white people to understand that, although you didn't personally have own, own a slave or you didn't personally uh, shoot that little kid in the back of the head or whatever, how do you uh, lynch anybody? How do you get them to understand that systemic racism is a serious problem that needs to be dismantled and, and, and that is the only way that we'll ever, in our lifetime, perhaps, have a harmonious uh, society where, where whites and blacks and Mexicans and, every, and Asians, we can all get along, you know, or, or, at least, or at least respect one another. Right. I don't really get into quite it from that angle, but I have, speaking at schools, people say, well, what can I do now? And um, often I'm speaking to a very diverse audience and I say, well, my generation took care of legal segregation, but now we can see discrimination in so many more ways. We can see it based on religion, home language, um, skin tone, 
Even what part of the country you're from. Or we, we can see poverty, um, hunger. Whose neighborhood does the um, freeway exit go through? We've got all these different ways of looking at discrimination now. And basically, you have to pick which aspect of that speaks to you the loudest and get out there and do something about it and make, I hate to say allies, but alliances with other folks who agree with you on that issue. You don't have to agree on everything, but work on what you do agree on. And you know, make the world better. Yeah. Answer that same question, Loki. Yeah, so, you know, the original title of the film, The Uncomfortable Truth, was actually Why You Are Racist and Didn't Even Know It. And I, I, I actually felt that that might not strike a chord with the audience that needs to see it. Okay. You know, I, I, I thought it was a little funny, but, you know, I was like, okay, this is not going to work. So, I, you know, then I realized that there was this uncomfortable truth that I was dealing with in regards to my family history. But uh, my point being is that if you, white people feel under attack. So when you talk about slavery, they feel that you're talking about them because they don't, they don't separate racism from, they, 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 see sep they see racism as slavery, as you know, you know, burning crosses and white hoods and so forth, those, those sort of things, and not the institution side of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so they take it personal. So suddenly it's like, well, you know, that's why you hear, well, I never own any slaves. And I have people say that to me all the time. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad you don't. Um, and, but that's, that's not what we're talking about here. What did you call that in the movie? You said the, 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 the I don't own any slaves syndrome. I don't own any slave syndrome. Yeah, it, it's, it's that argument that, you know, you try to diffuse, you know, the, the, it's, it's the excuses that you make to try to not have a real conversation because people feel under attack. Um, so the first, the first thing that has to happen is, is, so when you tax someone's ignorance, they're gonna double down on stupid, mm -hmm. right? We see that all the time. Instantly, they're gonna put those walls, it doesn't matter how wrong they are, they're gonna double down on stupid and put those walls up and protect their ego, protect their pride, because no one likes to be attacked. Right. That's, that's, that's not the intent, but that's how it's received. And so um, I, I, I actually tell people, look, it's not your fault. Today, slavery is not my fault in the past. Segregation is not my fault. I, I, I was never born in any of those time periods. That's not... So I, I kind of try to move people out of that mindset and then teach them the history. And that's where the film comes in. Because once you understand the why, the what informs, but the why transforms. And when you start to understand the why of why we are where we are, why people think the way they think, why you were lied to from the Daughters of the Confederacy who went about rewriting history books. The reason we have that narrative of the lost cause and everything and, and the happy slave stories and all that sort of nonsense is because it was actually very well orchestrated and the history was rewritten. So a lot, I tell a lot of people what we're doing is writing the history, rewriting the history back to what it should have been. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're still debating the Civil War about what it was about, there was no debate about it back then. You know, 150 years later, now we're saying, oh, it's state rights. I'm like, okay, well, the right to do what? And they're like, um, own people? I'm like, that's, a, that's called slavery, right? So you have to kind of meet people where they're at and take them along. But to, to move people, it's really one person at a time. Um, that's, that's where that change, change truly happens. Um, you know, it's like that old song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we have to move away from accusatory language and more of, of, of building, building knowledge, right? Because right. a lot of people just lack, lack an understanding. And you would assume everyone knows, right? Everyone should know about slavery and Jim Crow and how all this went down. But the fact of the matter is, is that you know, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean anyone knows it. Most people don't have the time to research that, to look into it and, and dissect it. Not because they don't necessarily care, because they're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and so for... for 
you know, for us, I, I, I was fortunate. I was raised differently, clearly. You know, my mom's, my mom's narrative and so forth and what I was raised under that um, put me at an advantage. To, and, and, and I have that privilege, that white privilege that, that you hear about as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it was, you know, what can I do um, to help move this along? Because you ask, you know, how do I reconcile that? And I don't necessarily feel like I ever could reconcile the fact that my family owned people. There's another thing is, is, is stripping away some of the language that, that dehumanizes, right? So we say, you know, um, slavery, you know, there were slaves. No, they weren't slaves. They were people that were enslaved. Slaves didn't come from Africa. Right. You know, doctors and lawyers and scientists and moms and dads, you know, and engineers, people came from Africa and were enslaved. And when you start humanizing that again, uh, it, it's hard to argue that. So that's why they're illegal aliens. They're this, they're that. No, they're, these are human beings, right? Um, when we start to embrace that understanding, it, it's a really hard thing to argue. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna get everyone. You just aren't. The fact of the matter is some people are just flat out racist and they don't care and they, just, they don't want to admit it, but everyone knows it. And, you, you know, LeVon Brown says, you know, I asked him, so what do you do with those people? He says, I just say F you and walk away. I'm like, yeah. all right. Um, everyone else who wants to talk, I'm willing to talk to them. If they're willing to learn. You can educate. You know, my job is to educate people. Whoever I'm educating, their job is to start to learn. And, and, and that's, that's really where we're, where we're at this point. And we're seeing that where people... Um, we're over a half a million, I think, we're, yeah, over a half a million views now on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting, you know, messages every day on Instagram or Facebook, and Twitter. People are asking questions and saying, you know, I, I, why, why did I not know this? They're realizing that they've been lied to. And, and these are white people who really want to know. And what can I do? And I'm like, educate yourself. I've got a couple things to add to what I said. We need to remember that historically we are all out of Africa. So it's just that we have mutated this way and that way. But we're all, go back far enough, Africa. Now beyond that, I think all the world's major religions teach that we, the people, were created in the image of the Almighty, by whatever name we call the Almighty. So if I'm disrespecting you because of the color of your skin, the language you speak, your sexual orientation, um, you know, any old thing, if I'm disrespecting you, I'm disrespecting the Almighty. And I'm thinking, that, you know, in the hereafter, that could have a serious consequence. But I think we need to remember that we're all created in the image of the Almighty. Right. Let's, let's, let's talk about, uh, Loki, you talked about uh, humanizing. Let's talk about actualizing like what you did. Mm -hmm. film. Uh, again, uh, congratulations on your film, um, The, un, uh, the uh, Uncomfortable Truth. You talked about how we had eight sitting presidents who were slave owners. We had uh, senators, governors, mayors, uh, Supreme Court justices right. who owned slaves. Uh, that speaks volume as to why the wheels of justice turn so slowly mm -hmm. in, in social equity, in regards to social equity. These people who are writing the laws, and this is something I've, I've spoken on often, I've said that the government makes the rules, the government enforces the rules, they makes the law, enforces the law. The government, uh, no group of people has ever been able to reach their full potential when they're being targeted for failure by their own government. Right. The government makes the laws, the government enforces the laws. And so this is how they've been able to continue uh, having their foot on the necks of marginalized groups, uh, particularly black folks, is because these people 
uh, that are in the position to make something change, to hold police officers accountable, and so on and so on, uh, they are embedded in the system. They are the decision makers. They, they, are, uh, they have the power invested in them by the government. <laughs> and they have the protection of the US military mm -hmm. to carry out their orders. So when you when you spoke on that, you know, I, you know, I know about the, the the you know the presidents and you know the I, I know that there's mayors and senators and stuff like that, or, you know, who are a gov uh, you know governors and uh, Congress people reps who are racist. Mm -hmm. But I, I I didn't really just think how heavy it was in regards to slavery, how these same people. Yeah. owned slaves and this is how they were able to maintain the institution of slavery right how how you know and you you also spoke about how how uh, racism uh is is a social construct mm -hmm. in, in america right right so is white supremacy still the official policy of the u.s um, <laughs> that's a great question. You know, white people created white supremacy and, and we should be at the forefront of dismantling it. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, pl plain and simple. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, well, we'll take a look at the 13th amendment. So, I mean, the answer is yes, because if you look at the 13th amendment, it has not abolished slavery. Mm -hmm. I mean, it slavery still is legally allowed as a form of punishment for those who break the law. That's why we have mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we just rebuilt the structure. So it, that's when you had the, um, oh gosh, we just, we just did a podcast with, uh, with Carol Anderson from White Rage. We talked about this. But um, you know, with the penal farms and so forth, the, uh, the con, you know, conscription of, of labor. So they took, they, they created vagrancy laws so, so, after, so, so freedmen were wandering the country looking for their families, right? Slavery's over, but family, you know, slavery broke up families, right? So, sell, a, sell a child over there, sell a, you know, a, a husband over there. So when the war ended, African-Americans were looking for their families. And the, the, the plantations still needed people to work. So the system, and you, you no longer had a police, you know, the, 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 the uh, um, oh, I blank on the name at the moment, but basically the, the, you know, slavery was its own police force, right? So now suddenly you needed these people to go back and work on the farms. Well, the way to do that was to simply arrest them on vagrancy laws. If you don't have a job, guess what? We're going to arrest you. You get arrested. And then we're going to sell you back and you know, we're going to sell you back to the plantations. We're going to rent you, if you will. And so suddenly, you know, all of a sudden now you've, 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 you've re-enslaved people through that system. And mass incarceration is just a continuation of that. You take away the right to vote and everything. And that, that so yeah, so if you, even if you just look for the basics of voting, Right. The civil rights movement understood at the end of the day that, you know, as they were doing the riding the buses, as they're doing the lunch counters and stuff, things weren't going to change until you actually change the, the rules. And if the only way you can change the rules is to vote. And that's why voting, you know, voter suppression is so prominent now is because there's more people of color who can vote. But uh, Florida uh, their, in their constitution, when they wrote their Jim Crow laws, they very quickly um, said, well, if you were arrested, you can't vote. Well, look who they were arresting, right? Black people to sell them back to plantations. Well, now you got a record, you can't vote. There's something to be said that when Mississippi's constitution, which was kind of the, 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 spear, uh, the spearhead for all the Jim Crow laws was the 1890 constitution. As they're writing the 1890 constitution, they are creating parchment penitentiary. Mm -hmm. The same year they write that constitution, they are creating parchment penitentiary. What does that tell you? Yeah. But voter suppression is a form of, of maintaining the status quo. And that status quo is whiteness. You know, this country was designed for people who look like me, 
my gender, my color. Mm -hmm. We designed it for us. And those in power want to stay in power. And that's where you come back to that fear question. It's like, well, what's going to happen if black people suddenly, or, you know, Hispanics are suddenly able to start running the country? Because eventually they are. Otherwise, we're going to be apartheid system, right? Um, but that fear comes back. What are they going to do? Well, that fear is built in because it's always been there. You know, uh, this is what happens, you know, when Emmett Till came down, you know, the Brown versus Board of Education, you know, they called it Black, I think it was a Black Monday. Um, a judge was actually talking about this. He wrote a book about it, was selling it, was on the circuit in Mississippi, stirring people up that misogynation, you know, look, these, these black guys are going to come down, they're going to rape your white women. Emmett Till walks into this situation and it gets accused of whistling at a white woman and gets lynched for it. 14-year-old, he had just turned 14 years old. But the yeah. whole, the whole mentality was you see this is what happens we told you this was going to happen black men are going to come down and start you know accosting your white women yeah the true part about it is that most white women get raped by white men that's yeah. a that's a statistical fact it's not something that i'm guessing making up or I'm, I'm, no. this is a fact but somehow they've made it uh they they made white women to believe that black men are the one they should fear the most. Uh, mm -hmm. That the black guy is the boogeyman, he's gonna rape you. But, and, and also most white women get killed by white men, but somehow they figured out a way to make white women feel like it's the black man that's gonna kill you or the black man is gonna rob you. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, remember, I remember riding on the freeway one day, I was in, I was in a, a brand new, Lexus. This is like when Lexus first came out. Right, right. I'm only saying this just, just, just to paint the, the, the pictures for right. you. But I'm, I'm, I'm rolling down. I'm, I'm on the freeway, man, and I'm doing like 60 because I never do the speed limit. The speed limit was a 55, yeah. so I'm doing at least 60. And the lady on the other side of me, that's in like some little old beat up Toyota, is doing about the same amount of speed, and she's a middle aged white woman. Mm -hmm. and she looks over at me and reaches and let me see she's in slow motion hitting the lock on her car door. At 60 miles an hour. <laughs> 60 miles an hour, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm not the one, like, you know, even if I was the type that you could profile, I, it's not likely that I am going to rob you. Look like I need to be locking my damn doors. Mm -hmm. Stop you from trying to rob me. Right. I'm, you know, I'm the one, I'm the one in the brand new car. But, you know, I saw a video, I, I saw a photo that you held up in the film of your mother when she was a baby. And in that photo was another woman and you pointed and said, that's her with the help. I had never heard somebody use the word help in modern day time to describe anyone like 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 in a I guess it was a domestic setting. Explain that picture. Like well, yeah. Yeah. So that photo specifically is my mom with the help. So my grandmother, after she gave birth to my mom, you know, was was too exhausted to take care of the baby and, and felt that she needed some help. And so it's the only photo we have just for some reason she was willing to you know what was she she was a maid well i was too young to remember but she she was the maid and she's helping my mama with me yeah okay what, what i'm saying is this <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I'm understanding okay now okay what her role was but i'm saying right. we don't use the term help the help no to, to describe to describe a, a, a maid or or a housekeeper. We no. In fact, most of us uh, in, in the South now we actually use the word housekeeper. Uh, right. But I had never heard help. Ex the only time I ever heard help referred to as a person who was a, a, a what. The only time I've heard a person who was a, a housekeeper or a maid referred to as help. The help is when I saw that movie. The right. Help. I used to help because of the movie because that, that way I could put it into reference for people because 
a, a, you know, if, if you say mage, someone might think that that's, you know, that that'd be a higher level in today's society. Someone might look at that a little differently. But help sounds like, the help sounds like Jim Crow, bro. It sounds like that's the help. And so, well, that was Jim Crow. Huh? That was Jim Crow. I understand. <laughs> Just, it's historical. I'm giving a historical reference to what's taking place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk. <laughs> you know, you know, well, look, I mean, I, I'm quoting George Wallace and dropping the N-word when I'm doing that because I'm giving historical reference. I'm not sitting there cleaning it up saying, you know, N-word now, N-word tomorrow, N-word forever because well, you know, historically what he said was so important that you don't want to water that down. What, what, is, what is people who... You know, and I heard you. I heard you say that, that the N word a few times in the movie. What is what do people take on that? Um, yeah, I haven't had anyone say anything to me about it, uh, but because I, I only use it in historical reference. Yeah, and and I, and I and I'll tell you this, man. Like when I heard it, right? Uh, I was taken aback, but really. I wasn't offended because I knew that you were using it in historical context. See, to me, context is everything. Mm -hmm. And so it, it wouldn't even sound it right if you would say, yes, uh, yes, so he called him the N-word and then this, that, yeah, you know, it's a film, you know, it's not, you're not on a... With Loki's film um, about me, an ordinary hero, when they were showing that on PBS in Utah, they were a little concerned about having the word in there. And they brought in leaders from the black community to see it and get their opinion. And they say, you've got to leave it in. That is historically correct. I, I got that part, but but I got it. I got it. Jack yeah. explained it to me. I mean, I got the, I got the N-word part. It was the help part. That right. I was <laughs> Yeah, you still hanging? You still hanging on the help, huh? Yeah, like it's the help. <laughs> but I, I got it, man. I, I got it. I got it. Right. What? What? Uh, is there? Is there a? Uh, is there a movie like in in the works for, for for Joan? Because I know you got to be thinking along those lines. You're a filmmaker. You're creative. So you got. Yeah. Yeah, we're actually, yeah, so and we, and we, you're, you're referencing a narrative film. Um, is there a narrative feature in the works? We're, we're working on that. Um, actually, I just had a call today with a group that's interested in doing a uh, kind of a, um, you know, multi-part series. You know, you know like we used to call them mini series, but now they're like episodic series like you would have on like a, a streaming platform. So four or five episodes to really tell her story. Um, so there's different ways that we're looking at that from a narrative standpoint to be able to. You know, About me. What's that, Mom? I feel, uh, you, uh, you're looking at doing something more about me? Oh, we're always looking to do something more about you. Yeah. Well, I get on to something else. Well, yeah, well, I've got Megger Evers film that we just finished the documentary on, and I am working on Emmett Till. Uh, but a narrative story, we've done documentaries, we've done books, but there's always ways to tell the story, Mom to bring it to a new audience that, you know, might not be interested in documentaries, might not be interested in, you know, in reading, you know, so you got to find new ways to bring it uh, attention to the audience. And our, you know, my goal with that is, is to, to be able to share this story of this unique tale of a person who is willing to make a sacrifice, um, you know, to go across, you know, to change her, her DNA, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And, Here's an example of someone who did what was right, even though it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. right? Who chose, like Luvon says in An Ordinary Hero, who chose the courage of her convictions. And if we would all just do what we know is the right thing to do, too often we we stand back instead of you know instead of stand out. Right. Um, and and so all of that is focused towards what we do with our foundation which you know, uh, I set up a 501c3 to help share my mom's story and, and work with schools. And uh, you know, our mission is to end racism th through education. Yeah. We, we know how the South made its money in slavery. How did the North, East and West make their money? Because oftentimes slavery. the other regions are absorbed. You know, uh, uh, you know, they get a pass. They get a pass on, on slavery. Right. They, they think of slavery and they just think the South. 
Yeah. How did these other regions of, of the United States, these other slaves and outside of the Confederacy? Yeah. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free anybody. It only applied to areas where the federal government had no control. So they still had slavery in Delaware and Maryland and Washington, D.C. and other places. Um, so there was slavery well beyond the South. And that cotton, man, that, that fueled the economy up in New England and all. Those right. cotton mills and textile places, they got okay. their cotton from the South. And um, yeah, and food, a lot of good food. It was corn grown in the South with slave labor. The North is just as complicit. They might have given up slavery years ago and you had those border states like my mom speaks about. But at the end of the day, they, had, they were getting their resources somewhere and that was from the South. And that's why there was always a compromise. You know, the three-fifths clause and so forth. There was, there was debates when they were signing the Declaration of Independence whether or not they should even have slavery in this land of the free. Mm -hmm. But you know, they quickly gave up that idea knowing full well that they needed that or they felt they needed that. Right. Uh, fuel their economy in the North, just as well as in the South. No, you participated in the March on Washington, correct? Pardon? You participated in the March on Washington, correct? I spent the summer um, after the sit-in in Jackson working in the March on Washington office in D.C. And then the day of the march, I worked in the press tent up on the monument ground. Okay. Yeah. And how was that? You knowing that you were like, did, were you aware that you were making history? No, I was just doing what needed doing. Right. I mean, I didn't think I was anything special. Yeah. But um, my sons tried to make me into someone special, but I was just one of the students doing what students back then were doing. You know, I, I feel that 100% because oftentimes, you know, people give me credit for doing what I do, bringing these issues to life and, you know, speaking on stuff that other people's people are afraid to speak on. And it's just in my DNA. It's just something that I naturally do. I don't really think about, oh, I'm doing something special. Sometimes people have to like, you know, kind of jerk me and say, hey, man, look, you know, like, hey, you know, and I'd be like, oh, I guess maybe, cool, all right. <laughs> but, you know, it's not something that I'm really cognizant of, you know, every day that I wake up. It's like, I'm just, I just open my eyes. And when I open my eyes, I look around and I say, I got them. And yeah. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I got them. You know, once I open my eyes, I got them. Because I'm, I'm about to go put in some more work. So. Yeah. So I really, I really do. I get that. I understand it. I like the way you say DNA because I say that, or maybe I had a DNA that predisposed me to, you know, activism in jail. Yeah. Great grandmother in Iowa was one of the ladies who chained themselves to the railing at the Iowa State Capitol and got arrested. And this was was part of the suffrage movement. So great grandma went to jail. And then her husband, a small town doctor in um, Iowa, he thought the new preacher went on too long. And he got tired and got up and went and rang the church bell, which the fire bell, church bell, same difference. And that emptied out the church. Mm -hmm. And he was arrested and fined $10 for disturbing divine worship. But as he put it, that the preacher never went on like that again. So I think there is a DNA component that affects the way we think. Right. What, what at, the, at that time when it was so much, I guess, you know, during the civil rights movement, at the height of the civil rights movement, that was so much violence. Uh, which which one of those? And I, I hate to try to minimize somebody, and I'm not really trying to do that. But sometimes I think when when a particular event occurs and a, per, a, a particular person, you know, loses their life, uh, it kind of kind of shakes us, it rocks us to the core. Were there like was there somebody that was in that movement that was like that for you when that person died, and you was like, man, this is 
this is madness. Like, no, because I think we all knew that at any moment in Mississippi, any of us could be killed. It was just the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. And you grieved when Megan was killed and when Cheney and Turner and all were killed and somebody else was shot or something, but you knew it was going to happen. At that time, did, was you were you like nonviolent? Would you did you believe in nonviolence, or do you believe that at some point I believe in nonviolence? But hey, if it come down to it, uh, bush in the head with a pipe. What, what do you think? I mean, like I was, I felt religiously and all that nonviolence was a, a strong goal of mine. I hoped I could stay nonviolent, mm -hmm. you know, turn the other cheek, but. If you're sitting at that lunch counter or you're surrounded by a mob, you got your friends on either side of you. If you start trying to fight, you're going to be minced meat. Mm -hmm. If you just sit there and let the photographers do their job and the press is there, and I want to say the press was as, every bit as subject to the attack as the demonstrators were because they were taking their story out to the world. And um, so that they were attacked too. But, and if stuff starts flying, it can hit anybody, demonstrator or mm -hmm. you know, member of the press or innocent bystander, completely innocent bystander. But um, no, you knew you, you could die. And I always say that would you rather die for a cause? Or get hit trying to cross the street with the light at rush hour. Yeah. You know. So what do you think about Loki? You know, Loki and his activism. You know, it's like I say, it's it's a different form of activism, but it, you know, like I always say that protest happens uh, in various ways, and this to me is a different form of protest. Uh, what do you think about Loki and his path that he's chosen? I'm proud of my boy. Yeah. He's done good. Um, it's one thing to be taking it to the streets, but taking it to the classroom and educating people is just as important. I say for everybody on the front lines of sort of things, somebody has to be having their back. Whether it's making movies, calling the press, give, you know, driving the cars, whatever. You gotta have equal numbers on the front lines and having the back. And he's sort of between front lines and having the back, actually, as much as he's doing. Mm -hmm. But he is getting the word out. So, right. Got it out to you. Got it out to me. He, you know, he got the word out to me. Yeah, like I, I've been. I, when did we meet, Loki? What was that like? Maybe four years. 2017 National Black Film Festival. Okay, so that was so three years ago. So yeah. yeah. Jill but, Malone, I think it was, wasn't it? Right. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um yeah, me and me and Loki met about yeah, I guess that was 2017. And uh, you know, we've been in, in contact, you know, ever since. Uh and and I I like to see what he's doing, you know, because he's always doing interesting stuff. Like he's always into like some some interesting film and 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 he's he's found his he's found his uh he's found his stroke with it that he's there all the way he's all the way he's locked in so to speak so uh, and I'm I'm proud of you too man and uh, I wish you uh, continued success uh, so we had over five hundred thousand views right now on mm -hmm. Amazon for the uncomfortable uh, truth yeah. right? so fam. Uh, I watched it. It's very interesting. It is a history lesson, uh, as 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 Joan alluded to. It is a history lesson worth watching. Uh, I would suggest that you go check it out. Uh, is there any other medium that they can watch it on? Oh, uh, right now it's just just on Amazon. We have DVDs off of our website, uh, the yeah. JTM the Foundation. Website? Yeah. What's the website address? JTMFoundation.org. So, with that said, family. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you, legend. Thank you, legend. Oh, thank you, sir. Man, I, I was, when, 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 when uh, Loki first uh, told me, you know, you know, who his mother was, 
uh, I was like, yeah, for real? Like, <laughs> you know, really? Like, that, 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 that's, it's always impressive. Like I said, I'm always, you know, impressed by people who are willing to risk something. And uh, some people, uh, they just play it safe the whole way. And to me, that ain't living. Uh, I, 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 I'm, if, if I feel passionate enough about something, uh, you know, I'll speak on it, I'll act on it. And, and I appreciate the work that you put in and the work that you continue to do and the people that you continue to inspire. I want you to know that you are continuing to inspire people and motivate people. And this is why Loki thought it was necessary for you to be involved in this interview because he knows you're something special. I want you to know that. You got to know that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I keep me out of trouble, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's all love, and uh, hey, anytime you want to come back on, uh, you're welcome on Willie D Live. I appreciate y'all. Until next time, family, no more talk. What the ladies talking about?